Warfare today is more war against us. It's war against the people. And that's Israel's niche. If you're fighting wars against the people, whether it's in Afghanistan or Iraq or Palestine, or if it's in your own country, an Occupy movement that's protesting neoliberalism, and that's exactly the niche that Israel fills coming out of its Palestinian laboratory. This was Professor Jeff Harper, and with him we are diving headfirst into a conversation that most people would rather avoid. Why? Because it's uncomfortable, it's complex, and it forces us to rethink everything we think we know. But that's exactly why we're having this conversation. Welcome back to Solkib Analytics, where we challenge mainstream narratives and dive deep into global events. I am Thomas Gerard, your host, presenting weekly insights from recognized thought leaders like diplomats, academics, intelligence experts, and sometimes activists of some sort. So join us as we uncover the hidden stories beneath the headlines. You can find us on YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any of your other preferred podcast platforms. The Israel-Palestine conflict isn't just a battle over land, sovereignty or politics. It's a human story. A story tangled in layers of history, identity and the power structures that shape how we see the world and each other. And Jeff? He's one of those with the right tools to truly unpack this mess. Why? It's because he's an anthropologist. And I know what you're thinking. So what? Well, let me tell you why it matters. Anthropology isn't just about studying ancient bones and distant tribes. It's about understanding how people behave, how cultures evolve and how power works over time. It asks some tough questions like, what stories do we tell ourselves about who we are? And how do these stories shape the way in which we view and treat others? Now, one of the things we are going to tackle today is something most people have virtually no clue about. And that's the militarization of everyday life, not just in the military, but in the police forces of your town. Israel's so-called battle-tested crowd control weapons are already on their way. In War Against the People, Jeff lays it out how Israel's occupation of Palestine isn't just about controlling land. It's about a much bigger system of global militarization. Israel has not only perfected the art of population control, meaning automated surveillance, face recognition, behavioral predictions, drones, militarized policing, but they've become the world's top exporter of all of these products. And the frightening part? The strategies used in the West Bank and in Gaza are being sold to governments all over the world, used to silence dissent in places you would never expect. So next time you see a shiny new humanoid robot, don't be so quick to cheer. Those machines, powered by Israeli software, may not be your friend, especially if you're one of those growing voices daring to challenge authority. In our tech-driven age, where tools of repression are being sold like commodities, the connection between Israel's occupation and the way power is maintained globally becomes all too clear. And in a conflict as charged as Israel-Palestine, where centuries of history and struggle have shaped both sides, who better than an anthropologist to cut through the noise? As you will see, Jeff doesn't just talk politics. He digs deeper, uncovering the cultural forces and human patterns that drive this endless cycle of occupation and resistance. And he doesn't just critic from the sidelines. He gets right into the core, virtually, peeling back the layers of how military policies shape everyday life, how ordinary people survive and how they can resist. This conversation isn't going to be easy. But if we are serious about building a future that breaks from the past, then it's one we desperately need. So get ready, because Jeff is here to shake up how we think and maybe, just maybe, change how we see the world. But first, an urgent message. Have you noticed how the voices speaking truth to power are getting harder to find? 
That's no accident. This channel is one of the few that dares to bring you unfiltered, hard-hitting political interviews and because of this we have been shadow banned. How do we know? Well, because of YouTube's own creator statistics and thanks to a growing number of viewer comments like these. But there is something you could do. Get involved with just two or three clicks. When you subscribe, like and hit the bell button, you are not just clicking some buttons. You are making a stand for free speech and independent thought. Your actions are crucial in helping us breaking through the barriers of the mighty YouTube algorithm and to reach more critical minds like yours. And if you haven't yet explored our previous interviews, you are missing out on some of the most revealing and insightful conversations available. Our archives include whistleblowers like John Kiriakou who risk it all to expose systematic torture in CIA prison camps for which he paid a heavy price, diplomatic mavericks like the US ambassadors Charles Freeman and Jack Matlock or the Dutch ambassador Nicolaus van Damme, and activists like the so-called Hamas lawyer Stanley Cohen or Ken O'Keefe the former US Marine who, with his bare hands, disarmed two Israeli commandos whilst they shot and killed 10 people on the Gaza Freedom Flotilla in 2010. So when you catch up on these eye-opening interviews, you arm yourself with the knowledge that others are trying hard to keep from you. I know it sounds cheesy, but your support is more than just appreciated, it's essential. Every view, every like, every subscription is a message to the system. Only with your help can we ensure that critical voices like the ones on this channel are not silenced. But now enough of this, let's sit back and enjoy another powerful interview that challenges the status quo. Jeff Harper, my pleasure having you. How is it going? Okay, thank you very much. I'm in uh, London at the moment. We have uh, an ICAD UK conference. ICAD is the organization I head, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. And we have a very active group here in the UK. So I'm here doing a uh, conference for us around the one democratic state solution that we'll be talking about. And then I'm doing a two week speaking tour as well. And then uh, around the UK from Exeter up to Edinburgh and Glasgow. Uh, and then uh, at the end, um, I'm meeting Richard Falk and, uh, and some other uh, activists uh, to begin to, to talk about the idea of organizing a, 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 a tribunal on Gaza, like the Russell Tribunal on, on Vietnam and the Russell Tribunal on Palestine a few years ago to do that as well. So I'm not in Jerusalem where I usually am. Um, but I'm here in London and happy to be with you. Yes, I'm, I'm really impressed. I have your website in front of me, indeed, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolition, and I'm happy to talk about this a, a little bit more. But you're really active. I mean, really active. Yeah. So you're making a tour in, uh, in the UK uh, right at this very moment. But a part of that, I have seen, I mean, you're, you're almost everywhere. So after the, after the recording, you have to tell me your secret, right? All right, I will. I'll give you okay. all the uh, drugs that I'm injecting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeff, um, I have a couple of notes here. Yeah? So uh, you're a well-known American, American Israeli anthropologist. I mean, what can be more suitable? Which, which field can be more uh, suitable to analyze what's going on in Israel and Palestine? So it's, it's, it's perfect. Yeah? You're an author and you're recognized for outspoken critique of Israel's policies in the Palestinian ter territories. Yeah, I have a couple of notes here. That's, that's what I'm reading. Yeah? And indeed, you're the co-founder, what you, what you already said, for the Israeli Committee Against House Demolition, ICAHD. ICA right. Now, that was, a mo that was a mouthful. Now, tell us a bit more about this organization. I mean, over and beyond the obvious, what the name already says. Right. Well, um, um, you know, I've been active now for, I've been, in, I, I grew up in the United States. And I moved to Israel in 1973, even though I'd been a student there before, um, not as a Zionist, uh, but, you know, in the 60s, 
<laughs> I'm an old 60s guy. Uh, we had this idea of revolution. And uh, when the 60s really collapsed, almost on January 1st, 1970, it's like a, a hand came down and they said, okay, you've had your 60s, they're over. Now we have Reagan and neoliberalism coming up. Um, I decided I didn't want to stay in the States. I didn't really feel a sense of belonging there. I didn't feel that it was, um, uh, you know, that the, that the issues there were, were issues that were global and really important. And I thought that Israel-Palestine was a more important for me personally, but also politically, a more important front in the revolution with a capital R. And I came here and I moved here in 1973. So, in fact, I am a settler, as we'll talk about settler colonialism, um, but I'm a settler who refuses, um, to take a phrase from Albert Memmi, uh, and, um, and, and so trying to do my work to end the Israeli settler colonial project uh, and to, you know, achieve justice with Palestinians in, in, a, in one democratic state, which we'll talk about. Um, so over all the years, you know, I've been very active, um, um, you know, fighting for Palestinian rights and against the occupation, Israel's occupation and Israel's uh, repression of the Palestinians, displacement of the Palestinians. Um, uh, but during the Oslo peace process, you know, that uh, when it ended, like in 2000, after seven years of feudal negotiations and Israeli continue its settlement all the time, um, it became clear that, that a peace process was not on the offing, that Israel was not going to end the occupation, that there wasn't going to be any kind of just uh, peace. And so uh, we in the Israeli peace movement, who had sort of suspended a lot of our work during Oslo to try to give the negotiations a chance at least, said, look, we have to re-engage now in um, in in fighting Israeli occupation and Israeli apartheid overall over the entire country, um, and this is at a time you know after uh, you know Netanyahu had been elected the first time, on a specifically anti-Oslo peace process program, um, and so a number of us in the Israeli peace movement from that's why we're called the Israeli Committee, because we said we're not going to start another organization. There already are organizations on the left, um, but we're a, 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 a number of organizations that came together um, in order to re-engage in fighting the occupation. And we went out and asked our Palestinian partners what issues they thought we should really focus on. Uh, and the issue of house demolitions came up all the time, which was an issue we really weren't that familiar with. Uh, we didn't know why Israel was demolishing Palestinian homes and where and how many and what was the mechanism for doing that and so on. Um, but we listened to our partners and we decided to become the Israeli committee of these organizations against house demolitions. Uh, and that led us to um, really go out into the occupied territories uh, to meet Palestinians, to meet families whose homes had been demolished, which is thousands, we'll talk about that. Uh, and uh, and at the same time, you know, unlike, you know, a lot on the left, you don't have to deliver anything. You know, you can have a demonstration, and if a thousand people come, great, and if five people come, okay, you know, I mean, we're never asked to really deliver. Uh, uh, but on house demolitions, if you go out to meet families whose homes have been demolished or are threatened with demolition, they expect, I mean, they're spending time with you. They're, they're you know, uh, you're apparently there for a purpose, right? And so you can't just go and say, well, too bad about your house. I'm glad you told me about it and go home. You have to deliver something, either rebuilding a house, which we've done. We built 189 houses over the last 27 years, or uh, trying to resist the demolition of their homes or trying to do something to um, prevent the demolition of the, you have to be there for them. And so we had to really learn the lay of the land. We had to learn how to get to Palestinian areas that we hadn't learned really before. Um, 
we had to, uh, you know, develop relationships with Palestinian partners, working relationships we hadn't had, hadn't had before. So it was really a chance for the Israeli left to really become more engaged, not just as protest from afar, but really engaged in the Palestinian struggle together with the Palestinians. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions really played a pioneering role in uh, in getting Israelis, uh, you know, in actual contact with and working with in a, in a joint struggle with the Palestinians uh, to resist Israeli oppression. And if you say that those uh, demolitions, where are you focusing on, in the West Bank or in Jerusalem? Um, mainly in, uh, in the occupied territories, which is the West Bank and East Jerusalem and Gaza. You know, we'd work, we'd, we've done work in Gaza uh, over the years, but also inside Israel itself. I mean, uh, in fact, the entire country is occupied. And we don't make a real distinction between the occupation of 67 and the occupation of 1948. <laughs> I mean, it's really, uh, you know, and that's why we're in favor of one democratic state as a solution rather than a two-state solution. Because the entire Zionist Israeli project of taking over Palestine began in what's today Israel which was, was taken over and the Palestinians displaced. 85% of the Palestinians uh, were driven out of the country, their lands were taken and so on. And then that process was replicated in 1967 in the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza. So we don't confine our activities only to the occupied territory, so-called. We really do accept the idea that the entire country is occupied. And so we do do work, in, and, and demolitions uh, do take place inside Israel. It is, they, Israel doesn't only demolish. In other words, the Israeli process of displacing Palestinians, Judaizing their country, taking their lands, um, did not end, uh, you know, in 1948. <laughs> that was actually the beginning when Israel was established. And it didn't end inside what became Israel in 1967 when Israel took the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. It, it all, so it's all one continuous process of displacement and Judaization, um, um, you know, over all these years. Uh, and so we, we do focus mainly in the occupied territory, but we also do work inside Israel. So since 1967, I'll just say, well, let me just put it this way. Uh, in 1948, in the Nakba, as the Palestinians call it, our war of independence. Um, and in, in subsequent years, Israel demolished a, about 530 entire Palestinian towns, villages, and urban areas. Uh, and uh, about 100 and let's say roughly 140,000 homes and schools and mosques and community centers and businesses uh, and farms and you know and all kinds of live uh, stock structures on, on so and so on were demolished at that time and then since 1967 another 60,000 homes and uh, no I, I, you know the same thing homes and schools have been demolished It's not true. It, it, it's about um, uh, it's about fifty uh, or sixty thousand in nineteen forty eight, and another sixty thousand since nineteen sixty seven. So altogether, it's a hundred and twenty, thirty, a hundred and forty thousand structures that have been demolished and communities and entire towns and so on, all together. You know, which is a tremendous, you know. Uh, amount of damage and destruction in the Palestinian community. Uh, and so, uh, um, you know, that's what we, and we've been trying to then raise that issue through. In other words, our rebuilding of homes are joint actions of political resistance. They're not humanitarian. This isn't good Israelis going out to build homes for poor Palestinian victims. It's this is joint resistance. It's a political action. And, and we're really trying because, you know, when we got into this as activists, when we started ICAD in 1997, 
it was more of an activist thing. We didn't really understand you know, the implications of house demolitions. What we learned over the years is that this is the essence of, of what's going on. In other words, if you say to a family, you cannot have a home, even if it's on your own land that you've bought, that you have, you cannot have a home here. You cannot have a home in this country. You have to get out, basically. Now you multiply that 140,000 times or, you know, over the whole country. And the message collectively is to the entire Palestinian population. And we see it in Gaza today. Get out. This is not your country. This is now a Jewish country. We're taking it over. Uh, and we're we're actually, you know, engaging in ethnic cleansing. We're taking your lands. We're destroying your homes, your infrastructure, your communities, and so on. So we kind of backed into it. But I think we backed into the issue, the essence of of uh, the Israeli uh, colonization, and that's why our actions, I think, are so important. And and it's allowed us to then get to know the reality on the ground, really become author authorities on these issues, really work closely with Palestinians. So when we go out, like I am now in the UK, and I go on a speaking tour. I mean, what I have to say, it, it, you know, it has a lot of authority behind it. It's grounded. I, I've been there. I've learned both, uh, you know, from the point of view of actual demolitions on the ground and, and you know, displacement and the experiences of families, but also as an Israeli, I can put it within a wider political context. And, uh, and from that point of view, I think myself and ICAD really do important political work that is really unique because we're really we're really there for the Palestinians on the ground. And you just said it's not over and you're right. I just so literally days ago arrived back from Jordan where I interviewed four high ranking diplomats, one of which was the former foreign minister, Dr. Marwan Warsha, and he was quite explicit. So Jordan is really concerned that Israel might try to drive the Palestinians over into Jordan. So and he's also very explicit that he that he really be believes that that's a purposeful policy of Israel to drive as many is uh, Israelis as many Palestinians out of Gaza and or the West Bank and potentially into Jordan but also into right, uh, into right, other countries. Right. So well, they're that's coming waves. Of, the, the, the you know this term that I've been using is really the essence of the whole thing: Judaization. The whole intent of Zionism. And this has been now a process of 130 years, has been to Judaize Palestine. In other words, to transform an Arab country into a Jewish country, to transform uh, Palestine into Israel. Well, genocide is built into that. You can't go and transform somebody else's country into your own country and take their lands and displace them without genocide, if not physical genocide, at least driving the people out, if not killing them all, and Gaza is somewhere in between, uh, and cultural genocide, in which you're driving them out and you're erasing all their historical cultural presence in the country because you're remaking the country as a Jewish country. So you have to erase um, the Palestinian presence. So you can't do all of that uh, and... Uh, and uh, you know, give equal rights to Palestinians because then you're not going to, I mean, the Palestinians are the majority population even today. It's about 50-50. Um, uh, so the only, if either you have genocide in which you eliminate the other people, that we haven't gone that far. Yet. Or you drive them all out. We have, we've driven half of the Palestinians out <laughs> of, of the entire country, but the other half remain. It's about 7 million that remain with about 7 million Israeli Jews. Um, or you do apartheid. I mean, if you can't get them out completely, you do take their lands, you do displace them, but you can't drive them out for different reasons. And so you confine them to small areas. So I have a map, you know, I use a lot of maps in my, in my talks and you, and you can see it very well. It's, it's what we call areas A and B 
of the West Bank. They came out of the Oslo process. You know, these little, there's about 194 little tiny enclaves all through the West Bank that are called A and B that are supposedly, it's fictional, but under the authority of the Palestinian Authority, you know, where, where the, and Gaza, where these 7 million, well, well, where 5 million Palestinians of the occupied territories are confined. And then you've got almost 2 million Palestinian citizens of Israel. You know, they're 20% of the Israeli population and citizens, but they're confined to 3.5% of the land of, the, of, of Israel. So if you take the entire country, half this population of the country that's Palestinian is actually confined to about 10 to 15 percent of the land of the country and that scattered into 194 tiny little enclaves that's apartheid all under israeli military legal and political control so it's an apart and you have to have an apartheid system now in an apartheid system of course um there is no economic viability for a palestinian population they're casual laborers and 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 the fact that you know Israel now sees them as a security risk, you know in South Africa the blacks, you know were taken as laborers in the South African economy. Israel doesn't want to do that because it it you know it, it looks at the Palestinians as um, um, as a terrorist population. I mean they there is resistance all the time. There has to be resistance. You can't normalize the relations with the Palestinians. And you don't want to give them money. You don't want to make the, make lives good enough that they stay. You want them to go. You want to make their lives miserable. And so what Israel has done is rather than integrating pal the cheap Palestinian labor of the occupied territories, Israel has imported workers from Thailand, China, uh, Romania, the Philippines, West Africa, and so on to replace the Palestinian to replace the Palestinian workforce. So now you'd only have apartheid, but you have a population of 7 million people that's excluded from the economy of the country. And that's where I think the fears of countries like Jordan uh, are, are justified, because in a way you're creating a situation where people have to leave if they, if they want to survive. And of course, the only way to leave is through Jordan, basically. Uh, uh, and they have families in Jordan, many of them. And so you will have that that pressure. But the other problem is, the other possibility is, and we see it with Gaza, is that a, a lot of Western countries will help Israel in its ethnic cleansing by offering humanitarian assistance. Humanitarian, to, yeah. What's called humanitarian uh, to so-called Palestinian refugees. You know, Gaza has been made uninhabitable. You have two and a half million Palestinians that, that are almost unable to survive there. Well, the solution should be if they not can't survive in Gaza, they should go back to where they came from, which is inside Israel. Israel should be held accountable for, for what's happening. If Israel's made Gaza uninhabitable, uh, the population should be allowed to go into Israel where they came from originally, where they were expelled from, and, and allowed to, to reestablish their lives. But because Israel wants to get rid of that population, that's part of the, of the, of the ethnic cleansing, um, it's going to rely on countries like Holland, European countries, the United States, Canada, Australia, and they'll all say, okay, you know what? We'll take 50,000 Palestinians from Gaza. We'll take 10,000, we'll take 20, you know, and if you divide it up among all these liberal countries for for humanitarian reasons, um, they'll take these Palestinians so, that have been made refugees by Israel, rather than Israel accepting responsibility, they'll take them uh, for humanitarian reasons and in that way aid Israel in ethnically cleansing Gaza. So, uh, so you know, uh, so that's the other part of it. It's either Jordan is going to be burdened with more uh, refugees, or, um, or you know, again under <laughs> our humanitarian rubric, you know, they'll be simply uh, exported to all kinds of other liberal countries.
I know from uh, Dr. Marban Warsha that who was instrumental, he was actually a key architect of the peace treaty between uh, Jordan and Israel, and he was the first Jordanian ambassador to Israel. And he told me that there is a clause in the peace treaty to prevent a, a mass transfer of uh, Palestinians into Jordan. That, that was on the key contributor. This, he said, literally, that's why we have the peace treaty. Yeah? So if Israel would try to push the, the Palestinians into, into Jordan, that might, that, might, that might have international consequences if the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan breaks, That's right. that, would, that, would, uh, that would be a game changer in, in the region. That's true. Uh, and uh, I, look, this whole thing can only continue because uh, Jordan and Egypt, and now with the Abrahamic Accords that Trump negotiated, you know, the Gulf states, the Emirates, Bahrain, uh, Oman, Sudan, even Morocco, they have all normalized relations. And now Biden is pushing the last piece into place, the crown and the, the jewel in the crown, which is Saudi Arabia. So in a way, you, you have to also say the Arab countries have been complicit in this as well, because uh, they've agreed to normalize with Israel. They've made peace with Israel, so-called. They have economic relations with Israel. Um, at the expense of the Palestinians. I mean, they haven't been great advocates for the Palestinians, including the Jordanians, I have to say. Uh, so, you know, in a way, I don't feel that <laughs> that bad for the, the these countries because, uh, you know, not only have they aided Israel, um, you know, in terms of just legitimizing it, recognizing Israel. I mean, they've recognized Israel, but at the same time, they, uh, uh, you know they've 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 given up the Palestinians. They don't represent the Palestinians. They don't support the Palestinians, and they keep supporting the two-state solution. You see, the two-state solution that all governments kind of accept is is ridiculous. I mean, there's a hundred and seventy, there's seven hundred and fifty thousand Israeli settlers today in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Massive, what we call settlements. It gives people the impression of little. Tiny places are, in fact, big settlement cities. You know, there are 30, 40, 50,000 people, a lot of these settlements, with all the massive infrastructure and the highways. So the West Bank has been incorporated into, into Israel. There is no more a West Bank or occupied territory that you can detach and make into a Palestinian so what you, a state. So what you're left with are the 194 little islands, the enclaves, where Palestinians have been confined in areas A and B. Well, then by, in a sense, then by accepting the two-state solution, what Jordan and all the other Arab countries and, you know, Europe and the United States and, and most of the other governments are saying is, yes, we will legitimize Israeli apartheid. We will recognize in Israel with its settlements, because nobody's demanding Israel uh, dismantle its settlements that are all illegal. So the whole settlement enterprise remains. You have an Israel from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, and that will all be recognized by Saudi Arabia, the Arab countries, and uh, the United States in Europe. And this is the normalization process that Biden is pushing today. And there will be a Palestinian state two-state solution, but the Palestinian state will be on 10% of the land of Palestine, you know, and fragmented into dozens of little islands. Maybe they'll consolidate some of them or whatever. So it's, in other words, the normalization process, the two-state solution that Jordan and, and all the other governments are pushing is really an apartheid situation, and they know that. So in a way, I don't feel a great deal of sympathy <laughs> for the Jordanians because they haven't stood up for the Palestinians. They haven't told the truth that the two-state solution is, in fact, apartheid. And, uh, you know, they're complicit in all of this, certainly. So, uh, uh, you know, I think that's, that's a real issue. That they've abandoned the Palestinians. They've really been abandoned by the Arab, the Arab governments. Uh, two things. First of all, I'm, unless I missed something grave, I don't believe that Saudi Arabia can now afford 
to approach closer to, to Israel, right? Whatever Biden might try now, I mean, Biden is a lame duck anyway. Uh, I think everybody, uh, the, the, the Israel waits and hopes for Trump to be uh, Trump to be elected because, he's, I mean, for a number of reasons, this this uh, plan of the century, yeah, where, where he basically hand, hands over the West Bank to, uh, to Israel. His uh, son-in-law, Jared Kushner, already discusses beachfront, uh, openly discusses beachfront property in Gaza, etc., etc. Et We have extreme settlers in Israel who, who insist they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, settle, settle in Gaza, all, all these kind of things. But for this, for the two stage solution, and I'm happy to discuss two state, one state, no state, but Ben Gurion's, I, mean, I have said this before, yeah, Ben Gurion in his letter to his son said then already that he, that he accepts the partition, meaning the two state solution only as a means to an end. And then the, the end, of course, is the greater Israel. So the slogan from the river to the sea is not a Palestinian one. It's today in the Likud Charter. That's right. So exactly. coming to the two state, one state. So where do you see this going realistically? Well, so it's going to go in one of two directions. If normalization takes place and Israel... Not likely right now. Not likely right now. No, so in, like, in these circumstances... The only country that's left is Saudi Arabia. I mean, the, the, the Emirates, uh, Morocco, Egypt, Georgia, they haven't uh, broken diplomatic ties. They haven't uh, rescinded their, 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 the agreements. Everything is going... You know, now with all the airlines that are canceling flights to Israel, there's only two airlines that are dependent that you can fly and you know they're not going to, to cancel. One is the El Al, the Israeli airline. The other one is the Emirates airline. <laughs> I mean, th this support for Israel, economic and everything else, uh, continues. I mean, the Arab governments are completely disconnected from their own populations. Their populations are are very angry and very supportive of the Palestinians, of course. But these governments, you know, have all these interests, partly not only between Israel and, you know, military and surveillance and all kinds of repressive technologies that Israel exports to them, but Israel is also kind of an intermediary because, I mean, Saudi Arabia is not going to make normalize with Israel because it loves Israel and Zionism. It's because it'll get from the United States. Um, they'll rescind all the sanctions on Saudi Arabia that have to do with human rights violations. Um, they'll, they, they might allow Saudi Arabia to develop nuclear weapons. They're going to, um, to uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, allow all kinds of weapons to be exported, American weaponry to Saudi Arabia. It wasn't, they're talking about a Middle East NATO, where Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Israel are the three pillars. So that, that's what sweetens the pie, you see, for a country like Saudi Arabia or, or, or the UAE. Um, and from that point of view, what does solidarity with the Palestinians get you? Where does that get you? In a transactional world that we live in, Israel ha is at the table. It has, it has high tech. It has the military, it's got a military experience, it's got the hardware, the software, it's got the surveillance, it's got the, the population control technologies. It can really help a repressive government like Saudi Arabia stay in power, and it can protect Saudi Arabia from Iran. I mean, it can deliver on all kinds of levels. What do the Palestinians have? So the people are in sympathy with the Palestinians, but governments that are thinking in terms of of control, repression, their economies, themselves making money, the corruption, all of that. I mean, you com you can't compare what they get from a relationship with Israel versus nothing that they would receive from from supporting Palestinians. So morality, human rights, international law, justice, these don't play much of a role in if any in international relations. And that's where Israel wins, it's because Israel knows that. And uh, it, it, it conducts what I call, I wrote a book called War Against the People, which is how Israel uses its military and its surveillance and its, uh, and its repressive technologies as leverages uh, in, its, in its diplomacy. Uh, and, uh, and it does that very successfully because that's what these governments need. And Israel can deliver 
uh, Palestinians in a transactional world have nothing to deliver. A couple of things. So first of all, Noam Chomsky told me that he fears that the Palestinians might have the same fate as the uh, Native Americans. Yeah. Then you said something worst really fate, important. Worst fate. The Native Americans, I mean, they suffered genocide. True. But, but you know, not, uh, then they got reservations, whatever. Uh, first of all, they're not, they don't have to live in reservations, but they're American citizens. They vote. They're their citizens. Palestinians. That's the difference with apartheid. Palestinians will be confined to these little islands, not viable economically. Uh, you know, with no land. You know, with no real life. Um, but they won't be given citizenship, obviously, in Israel because Israel has to remain a Jewish state. So they're worse off than the Native Americans. They can be confined, but they'll be imprisoned. In the, they're not going to be able to get out of those reservations, let's say, and they're not going to have citizenship. So, so it's a much worse situation than the Native Americans. You're actually right. I didn't consider it that way. But you said something about uh, weapons. Yeah? Um, I interviewed uh, Professor Chaim Rashid. He wrote, he wrote a book about um about Israeli army and in his book i think it was he lunch. describes give him my greetings give him my greetings yeah okay. uh he describes uh that israel sells sells weapons to about 130 countries in the world yeah and we talk about those uh, classified as battle tested weapons and of course it, there's a political catch It's not like Americans to sell weapons and you do what you want. Yeah. So with Israel, it's, it's a slightly different. In addition, I, I interviewed Jotam Feldman. He's an Israeli uh, documentary maker. He uh, m uh, made a documentary called The Lab, yeah, where he actually went into this whole uh, uh, arms, Israeli arms sales uh, circuit. So there is a massive... When, when people say, let's stop uh, selling weapons to Israel, that's the wrong approach. The world should stop buying weapons from exactly. Israel because that's that's the lifeline. Exactly. Right? That's right. That's right. I know Israel still needs weapons. I mean, eighty-five percent of the weapons it actually uses come from the United States. I mean, Israel can't produce an F thirty-five. Uh, it can't produce, you know, the the nuclear submarines. A lot of the uh, ships for its navy. You know, you know, a lot of the artillery. I mean, there's things that are too big for Israel. Now, Israel plays a key role because uh, it specializes in the in the software. So, for example, in the F-35, which is this cutting edge trillion dollar stealth bomber, um, a lot of the of the electronics are Israeli, the targeting systems and navigating systems. So Israel plays a role. You know, stop arms sales to Israel is hard because a lot of, you know, exactly. you can't produce those arms without the Israeli technology to some degree. But it's, and, and of course, Israel, again, it's true, provides that laboratory. So, you know, now you have F-35s in combat, in so-called combat, in Gaza, in uh, Lebanon now, you know, maybe in, in, in Iran. Before Americans have had a chance to use the F-35 in any kind of combat situation, so they they use Israel as a way of of testing, you know, not just that, exactly. weapon, a lot of different kinds yeah. of weapons. So stopping arms sales is important uh, because uh, because Israel does depend on arms from abroad, but at the same time, it's true. Uh, You also, if you really want to hurt, I mean, that's that's the operational side of it. Israel couldn't conduct the war in Gaza if the United States would stop sending the bombs, for example. That's true. But what would hurt Israel more in the long term and and really, uh, you know, make it unsustainable is if if the world would stop the technology transfers in the military, you know, that Israel couldn't market its navigating systems And it's all its high tech systems and its surveillance systems and all and all of that. That really gets to the to the basis of the Israeli economy. So it's it's more of a boycott of Israeli technology that's called for rather than stopping arms sales per se. Arms sales is more immediate, but the long term is stopping Israeli military uh, uh, technology transfers. 
which is not likely to happen because we are the globe, you know, is in an arms race right now, preparing for the big, how shall I call it, the big uh, cataclysmic exchange between who knows who. Well, Morocco just, uh, you know, just is 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 building. Uh, Israel is building in Morocco a whole plant for manufacturing drones. That Morocco, will, in other words, Morocco will then export drones into Africa in all the African conflicts, but Israeli drones produced in, like in a franchise in Morocco. So, I mean, you're right. The, the uh, you know, you know, the, the security politics work. I mean, if you, if you just weigh up um, a country's interest in, in, in its, uh, in its repression and its military capabilities and all of that, versus uh, human rights international law and so on they don't they don't add up and so that's that's a real problem we're facing is that we have no leverage over governments there's nothing unless we can somehow do bds and really stop um um you know the uh, the, the international support for the israeli economy um we're not going to get very far in terms of leverage but it's you know if the if the israeli economy was producing tomatoes <laughs> or some or tourist trinkets or something that the world really didn't need you could do that fairly effectively but you know israel produces things that the world wants including the united states in europe uh and so uh, you know again you know civil society has very little leverage over governments because uh, they want the Israeli produce. The the thing that most people don't realize is what you, I have to be mindful here, but, but what you see going on right now in a number of conflict zone, zones, which, which are fueled by Israeli weapons, will eventually come into your country, your being anyone's country. Right. It's exactly what Yotam said, it's a laboratory. The, Israel, the, the occupied tourists are a laboratory, they're testing it and they're selling this worldwide. So all this repressive technology from artificial intelligence, the wolf pack algorithms, the three, the red, blue, and I think yellow, whatever, in the background, this this is being sold to, to the highest bidder, sometimes even not even the highest bidder. Yeah? And well, I'm sure I, already... The way, put, the way I put it is as your militaries and your security services, you know, your FBI's and... Um, uh, you know, you know, whatever your security units are in your country and your police, you know, as long as they're being Israelized through Israeli technologies, Israeli weaponry, but also Israeli tactics of population control based on its on on its uh, hundred years of controlling the Palestinian population, you, the people are being Palestinianized. In other words, I talk about a global Palestine. Palestine itself is a is a kind of a microcosm, and I, that's where I think the word laboratory is really appropriate, because it's it, you know it's, it's this laboratory that these weapons and technologies are perfected on, and tactics of population control. You know, you got six hundred and fifty checkpoints in the West Bank, and all the Israeli security companies have, you know. Uh, uh, you know, are testing on these the millions of Palestinians that pass through biometrics, and they have all kinds of sensors and and um, uh, you know chips and all kinds of things like that that they then sell to your country. You see, to to, to everybody's country. So so literally, as your uh, authorities are being Israelized in terms of their tactics and 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 technologies, um, the people. All of us are being Palestinianized. I mean, Palestinian is is becoming a global concept now. This is where I called my book War Against the People, because wars today are not conventional wars anymore. You know, you've got you, know, all right, you have Ukraine, Russia, you've got um, now, you know, Israel with, uh, it's hard to say Lebanon is, a, is that kind of a war, but you know, you've had, you've had uh, those kinds of conflicts, but in fact, the last conventional war that involved two major world powers was Korea. 
You know, there hasn't been one since. Uh, it's the forgotten and, war. And, you know, and there's been wars between minor, you know, the Iraq, Iran, and different Israeli Arab wars, and, uh, um, you know, conflicts, you know, in Africa and so on. And, uh, I mean, there have been those sorts of things, but but um, not not major international wars involving major powers. So the point I'm trying to make is that uh, is that um, warfare today is more war against us. It's war against the people, not against uh, you know. It's not, uh, and that's Israel's niche, because the Pentagon can produce uh, the F-35 is a weapon for conventional warfare to attack Russian or Chinese targets. And so, you know, nuclear submarines are designed for that. But if you're fighting wars against the people, whether it's in Afghanistan or Iraq or Palestine, or if it's in your own country, an Occupy movement that's protesting neoliberalism, young people all over the world, including the global north, that have been excluded from the market, you know, that are being marginalized as well, that are restless. You have a whole rebellion of young people all over the world against neoliberalism. Well, you've got to repress that. And and F-35s don't help you do that. It's a different kind of warfare. And that's exactly the niche that Israel fills coming out of its Palestinian laboratory. You know, how do you control populations? Uh, and so... Uh, um, so, you know, the, yeah, I, I think that's really an important part of it is that what you were just saying is that don't think that, you know, we're, we're simply doing this because we're concerned about Palestinians. Certainly we're concerned about Palestinians, but the implications of what's happening really do affect everyone. We're all being Palestinianized in this neoliberal system of, uh, of uh, population control, you know, and inequality. And that coincides that coincides with the global trend to, you know, to populist governments, to right wing governments. Yeah, even here in the Netherlands, where where, where yeah. I'm uh, being, you know, they elected the most right wing elements that that free to elect. So these governments, of course, these future right wing governments, I don't want to say fascist yet. Yeah, but some people I spoke to, you know, are really concerned that, for example, America, the beacon of freedom, you know, might yeah. drift into into fascism. What but, do you think those governments will that, do? But this is where Israel, I mean, it's interesting. They used to be anti-Semitic. Some of them are still anti-Semitic. Um, these were very the right things. Populist yeah, yeah but, they, they're now pro-Israel. Exactly. Pro-Israel because yes. Israel is the model. Israel is what they want to be. They want an an ethno state. They want it. They want it. You know, uh, 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 a a white Dutch Holland, a white Christian America, and and uh, and some of the neo Nazis in the United States have said Israel is our model, because Israel is it, it took this whole country and made it Jewish. It's a Jewish state where Jews have the rights. And the other people are either suppressed or or driven out or whatever, and that's exactly the model that the right wing in France and Britain and and Orban and that's what they want, and that's where Israel becomes actually the model and a leader in these right wing movements. You know, Israel every year you have what's called the Jerusalem Summit, which is like a an in gathering of all these far right groups from all over the world. Israel's very close to the Weisgrad group in Europe. You know, everybody from Orban to Le Pen to, uh, to Farge and so on. So in all kinds of ways, Israel's playing uh, a role not only against our human rights and, uh, um, you know, wars against the people, but actually in support of these, these extreme right-wing groups. One of the reasons, and we know this, that Netanyahu is prolonging the war in Gaza. Um, you know, the Israeli army said four or five months ago, it's over. We've accomplished all our military objectives. There's no reason for us to be in Gaza. He's prolonging it to get, because he's hoping, like you say, that Trump gets elected. And then the whole thing begins to change. So he's trying to undermine as much as he can 
Biden by thumbing his nose at Biden, humiliating Biden, doing whatever, because he's relying on, on, on Trump getting elected. So Israel has become an active, uh, we, you know, and we pro progressives have to understand that. It's, it, it, it's exported not only its, um, its technologies, but it's exporting its model of a security state in which democracy takes second place to security and it's exporting this right-wing ethno-national religious model of a, a you know a, of a country so on all kinds of levels israel is playing a very uh, proactive role in in some terrible processes that are happening in the world for progressives and israel has a proven track record of supporting the most uh, repressive regimes on the planet and the other I way mean, around and the other way around yeah. i mean south africa is well known yeah but also what's less known is of course the nuclear connection between south africa and, and israel yeah? That's right. so there are interesting connections here um, um jeff you spoke about uh, colonialism so and let's say you were criticized for speaking about uh, colonialism in the context uh, of Israel. So in, in your point of view, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that the Zionist project is an ex expansionist one, has always been an expansionist one. And with the background, of course, is a, is a colonial uh, uh, project. Yes. Yes. So the question is, I mean, for I've spoken with so many people, so but not everybody is aware of that. Yeah. So, uh, who was it? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, uh, Biden in 1980s said something like, you know, uh, Israel is the unthinkable air aircraft carrier in the Middle East. Yeah. yeah. Or the who was it more more recently? The villa in the jungle. Yeah. The, this yeah, racist. Barack, uh, the villa in the jungle. That's right. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. 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 So where do we go from here? I mean, fr from a colonialist expansionist project where do we go from here well that's you know zionism was a settler colonial project it wasn't colonial in the sense of the dutch in in indonesia <laughs> which was an extractive kind of i mean indonesia was not going to become a part of the netherlands or whatever it was that was classical colonialism the british in india you know uh, you know the french in uh uh in west africa here it's settler colonialism like south africa like Algeria, like Australia, New Zealand, like the United States and Canada. In other words, where a people come to a country, settlers, with the intention of taking over that country. And they develop a whole narrative about why the country belongs to them. In our case, the Bible. It was like a, a ready-made narrative. And, and the intention is to take over the country. And, and like I said, the only outcome of that is either genocide or apartheid, or a, or a mixture of the two, both of which should be unacceptable to us. Uh, nevertheless, Israel has done it. I mean, it has taken over Palestine. It rules Palestine today. So the only way out, and you can't compromise, it's not a conflict. We always talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Israeli-Palestinian, it's not a conflict because there's no two sides. The minute you say the word conflict, you recognize the settler colonists as a legitimate side. Now they have the legitimacy because everybody from the Palestinians, to everybody else sees them as a side. Great. Now, if we're a side, now what do you do in conflicts? You negotiate, you compromise. Well, what are the Palestinians supposed to compromise on? That 78% of their country belongs to somebody else? That, that five, six million refugees can't come back? or maybe 10,000 come back in a compromise. I mean, the whole idea of, of conflict resolution negotiations makes people have to, it forces an oppressed people to give up its rights, you know, to compromise. So that's why we're urging everyone to adopt an anti-colonial discourse. Forget conflict. We shouldn't use the word conflict. We're talking about uh, indigenous Palestinian resistance. It's not terrorism because every colonial power criminalizes resistance, right? And makes it into terrorism. We have to reject that. That comes out of the conflict model. 
the anti-colonial approach would say uh, the indigenous Palestinian population is engaged in resistance against settler occupation or settler takeover or, or a settler colonial project. And that reframes the whole thing. Now, now what's the way out? Well, the only way out is to end the colonialism. It isn't to justify, legitimize a colonial system and then try to work with it. You can't do that's what the two state solution tries to do. And that's apartheid. So what you have to do is decolonize, dismantle all the structures of control and domination that Israel has laid over the Palestinians and then move like in South Africa, move to one democratic state of equal rights for everyone and the refugees coming back. That's the only way out is one state. Now we have discussions among ourselves and it hasn't all been worked out. Is this, would this be a Palestinian state in which the Israelis remain, but they remain as citizens of Palestine? Or would it be a new civil state in which the Palestinian national group and the Israeli Jewish national group are there, they have a space, but within a common civil state. There's all kinds of details to work out, but the only way out is to establish one democratic state over the entire country of equal rights for everyone. Um, and uh, uh, it's a hard <laughs> program, you know, because you have to replace Israel. Israel has to stop. You cannot have a Jewish state in 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 that country. That it that's simply a, a, you know a colonial state that has been uh, has been uh, uh, rejected all over the world, except in this one particular place. And uh, and unless that's done, um, uh, you know the settler regime is going to continue. The only way to get Palestinian rights and the only way to have real security for Israeli Jews that will stay uh, is in in the framework of uh, of a single common shared democratic state. You are not making any friends, Chef, I have to say, because what you're discussing is basically the end of the Zionist project, the end of Israel as of course, we know it. Of course. Well, the Zionist project is a colonial project. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be that controversial to say we should end a colonial project. I mean Colonization ended in most of the world, uh, you know, 50 years ago in the 1960s. I mean, why Why is this continuing? And at the same time, you know, it shouldn't be so outrageous to say a democracy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, is there a problem here between, between replace, you know, of, of replacing an apartheid regime that everybody, the UN, the International Court of Justice, Amnesty, everybody says and has documented this is an apartheid regime. So to replace an apartheid regime that's oppressive with an equal democracy, is that a terrible, radical idea? It is. <laughs> it is, for example, even European democracies. I mean, you know, yeah. why is that so outrageous? So I, it might get me in trouble, but on the other hand, I think to deny that really means you're very courageous you're very courageous so their voice is like and i know it's a controversial one benny morris so again noam chomsky said you have to make a difference between benny morris the historian and benny morris the person because he made kind of made a, made a u-turn yeah I, I i discussed exactly the same topic with him but he said no we cannot have a one-state solution because overnight israel would no longer be a jewish state and that's, that's not right. what that's i right. want he said the so there's yeah. What does a Jewish state mean? Do people really think? Yeah, good about question. It? Yeah, yeah. What does a Jewish state mean? I mean, what did uh, you know a white state mean in South Africa? I mean, it was obviously unjust and unacceptable, and nobody, you know, uh, you know, a white Christian America. I mean, ethno these these Orban type, you know, a Hungary that's only purely for Hungarians and. Uh, you know that that was the basis of anti-Semitism. Is that uh, you know they wanted to purify. That's where ethnic cleansing comes from. The Serbs, the whole Eastern European uh, kind of experience. So, you know, what does it mean a Jewish state? What, uh, how could a state belong to a particular people? A state, as, you know, if there were only Jews there, maybe. 
but <laughs> but the Jews are in fact either half the population or even slightly less than half the population. You know, they came into a country to take to to claim it as a Jewish state when ninety percent of the population was Arab, Palestinian Arab. So what right? I mean, there is no right here. We all, we even we don't even think about it when Jews say when the Israelis say and Jews say. You know, we have a right to return to our homeland. No, who gave you who gave you that right? God. You know, I mean, uh, what's the connection between you now and and some ancient people two thousand years ago? And in fact, I'm not going to get into this whole thing, but if you actually go back into history, Jews were not expelled from this country. Romans did not take populations and 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 transplant them to other places. The Jews, uh, matter of fact, uh, you know, after Jerusalem was destroyed and the Bar Kokhba, all of that, 100 or 200 years later, you had a whole flourishing of Jewish life here. That's where the Jerusalem Talmud comes from. Yavne and all these, uh, uh, you know, yeshiva type communities. I mean, there was a flourish. So Jews were never expelled from this country. Uh, they left because Jews became a very cosmopolitan people, basically. And they... Uh, and they left the country. A lot of them, some, a few of them stayed. But, but that's really the story. And so you can't say, uh, "All right, well, now we've decided to come back two thousand years later. Get out of the way. Now it's our." I mean, if you just think about it, it doesn't make any sense. But somehow people have kind of just got used to the idea that, yeah, it's a Jewish country in the Bible, and Jews have a right to return. Nobody has a right. I mean, you know, the Italian the, the Italians don't have the right to return to Gaul at Britain. <laughs> I mean, you guys don't have the right to return to Indonesia. I mean, what does it mean the right what does it mean the right to do anything? You know, people have countries and even in their own countries, they don't have an absolute right to anything they want to because they're not the only they're almost I don't know if there is a country that is absolutely homogeneous. You know, I mean, every country has minorities, especially today. And so this whole idea that somehow you have a right to a country that's purely your own people, that's a fascist. That's genuinely a fascist idea. And uh, and progressives say that in terms of Israel. Israel being where it is and being supported as it is, I mean, that it, it's always very easy to, to overlook the geopolitical component here. So in, in my perspective, religion is used, well, maybe one step, for, one step back, yeah? <clears throat> apologies. Many people, if you talk with them, they, they, they believe that Israel kind of is a consequence of the Holocaust. Not true. I mean, I mean so th this whole thing started at least in 1880, if, if, not, if not earlier. The Balfour Declaration was was uh, signed uh, was signed in uh, 1917, so it it goes beyond it. So, but there is a geopolitical interest to have Israel where it is, and I think this, these geopolitical interests, especially from from US UK, are still so strong that they will do anything they can to keep to keep Israel where it is. And this comes back to your one state solution, yeah, because. The, the one-state solution would not all, would not alone go against Israel's. How shall I say this? It's not everybody in in Israel, of course, yeah. But it, it wouldn't go against those forces in Israel who want to have a, a Jewish state. But it would also go against US, UK, uh, you know, the Western power, NATO, etc. That makes it a kind of double, you know, doubly dif difficult to uh, to do what people like you do. I mean, that was the equation, and that's the security politics I talk about. That was the equation until now. I, I Actually, Haim and I were talking about it over lunch today. Um, you know, uh, is that changing? I mean, is Israel still the strategic asset to the United States and NATO that it was before October 7th? You know, if in fact, Saudi Arabia is going to have problems normalizing with Israel, even though it would love to, because of even Saudi Arabia has public opinion. And if, in fact, you know, uh, Israel's going to, you know, start dragging through Iran, dragging China and Russia into this whole area. And, you know, and if there's a lot of instability here and half the United States Navy is in the Mediterranean, 
all of this, maybe, you know, that's going to begin to shift considerations internationally, that Israel becomes a liability to, uh, to, to the United States uh, and, and, and NATO. So, you know, that's a, that's a possible, things could change like that. Um, the other thing, by the way, that we have to remember, I mean, Israel is very clever. You know, Israel is not just a client of the United States. Israel, if you've noticed, where are the BRICS countries? Where's, where's China been the last year? Where's Russia? Well, Israel has very close military relations with China, you know, and business relations. The Chinese are now rebuilding Haifa port. The Chinese are, um, um, uh, you know, very involved in building the whole uh, underground subway system in Tel Aviv. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, India, which is a key to BRICS, is in love with Israel. Modi and, be and, and Netanyahu are blood brothers. Oh, of course. You know, the they whole the same. nationalism grew up together with Zionism. So that, so that you know, it's not that uh, if the United States abandons Israel, they're orphans. I mean, Israel could move fairly quickly into the BRICS orbit and, uh, you know, and find a lot of acceptance. So, you know, uh, th so the whole question be really becomes, um, um, you know, will Israel be able to navigate all of that and no matter what happens, keep this key position that it has in the Middle East? Or in some ways, are things going to change so that Israel loses that itch and it becomes a liability. In which case, you know, it is a small country. I mean, uh, you know, it could be made, made unsustainable. But right now, Israel's in a, in a position where it's riding the waves pretty well and is playing all the players against each other. Uh, and so I think Israel feels that it's, it's, fairly, it's in fairly good shape. Not among the peoples of the world, of course, but uh, but among governments and that's all it cares about the fault lines within israel society for example the ultra orthodox jews <clears throat> they're now conscripted to the mm -hmm. to the military then you have of course the split between the askenazi and the sephardic also the, the oriental versus the european uh, jews yeah and Then there came something <clears throat> that was unexpected to me. I interviewed uh, Dan Perry, who was the head of Associate Press for Middle East. He's a, he's a, a, a Zionist supporter, but he, he, he said something that, that was new to me. He talked about the partition, also this, this, <laughs> the, the split of Israel, but not between Palestinians and Israelis, but between Israelis and Israelis. So he says, <clears throat> we have on the, 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 the more affluent, the more higher, higher educated Israelis on the coastline who do no longer want those perpetual wars. And you have to rest. He said, <clears throat> he said, um, it's not very uh, realistic. Yeah. But for me, that, 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 that this very thought actually exists within Israel, uh, was new to me. And then very recently, I interviewed uh, Benjamin Beit -Hal um, Halani. I don't Great know if you talk. know him. Hello. So I, I, I mutilate names on a regular basis. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I run this by him, and he said, "Yes, actually, this thought exists, but how strong is it?" Yeah. But might that, what I'm referring to is, yeah. there might come a surprise that we that nobody really counts on that Israel actually might implode from within. Yeah, I mean, there's talk of that. Um... <clears throat> you know, Israelis leaving the country, the economy being, you know, its credit rating being lowered by the uh, by Moody's and and the Standard and Poor and the other credit agencies, um, and all of that, and it certainly is is having its its difficulties. But again, you know, it's it's a pretty solid uh, country. I mean, uh, uh, the economy is almost. Uh, BDS immune, <laughs> you know, if an economy that's based on military technologies, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, and that kind of, you know, uh, high tech stuff, there's always a market for that. And if it's not in the West, it would be in the BRICS countries. I mean, I think Israel sees the economic downturn as episodic. It's something that will change, you know, as we get past Gaza and all of that. 
And in terms of, you know, people leaving, I mean, you know, we're in the modern world today. It's not like Russia. A hundred years ago, where you left Russia and went to Palestine or went to New York and you never expected ever to go back. You know, that was a, a life-changing event. Today, you know, a lot of Israelis are going uh, to Cyprus or Greece an hour away. They're, they're renting houses, you know, because you can work from home. And they're riding out, you know, because instead of... Uh, um, living in hotels, if you've been displaced from your home in the north by the Hezbollah rockets, you're not really leaving the country. You're going out for an hour, for you know, an hour's flight for a few months, and and, and maybe your business. I mean, there's you're suffering. Your business could be closed or whatever, but it's not like you've left, and you know the country is is beginning to collapse. I mean, I, uh, Elon Pape has talked about you know that Israel's in a state of collapse. I don't I don't think that's that's true. I think it's going through some real, some real hard issues, and, and it's around Netanyahu. He's really the super divisive part of the country. I think once you get past Netanyahu, most of the country is right wing. Actually, um, the people in Tel Aviv are fairly isolated in what we call the Republic of Tel Aviv. Um, but, you know, they have their good lives. They're doing high tech and they're middle class and Israel's economy, I think, will be OK. So, you know, I think it'll 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 survive that, especially once Netanyahu is gone. Uh, it isn't the Palestinian issue that's dividing people. It isn't Gaza. I mean, if if there's fault lines, the real fault lines, you have millions of people in the streets in Israel. They're concerned about the hostages. They're not concerned about the Palestinians or the destruction of Gaza or the genocide. That's irrelevant. It's the hostages and the feeling that Netanyahu isn't doing enough to 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 release the hostages. You see, so those fault lines aren't fault lines over policy or where Israel should be going or human rights or Palestinian. It's not that kind of a fault line. There, it's more internalized, localized fault lines that I think will be largely resolved once Netanyahu is out. Netanyahu is sort of the, is the division, right? almost personally. Uh, and uh, uh, I think when he's gone, and then, you know, you go back to normal occupation <laughs> and normal ethnic cleansing and all of that without the, uh, without Gaza uh, and, and all of that, then I think things will, will settle back down. And that's the normalization and that's the danger. That's why I, I'm saying, you know, we have to really be careful that this normalization process doesn't continue. That's how settler colonialism wins. When, in fact, everybody sees the country between the, the river and the sea as Israel, and you just go routinely to your travel agent and you go buy a ticket to Israel, and, you know, it's Israel that's in the Olympics. And it's Israel, you know, and the Palestinians disappear pretty much. Um, you know, except maybe for some something symbolic here, they're like a watermelon. But, but you know, they, in a way they disappear as political actors. That's where settler colonialism wins. And that's why Biden is trying to push this normalization. He even uses that term. You know, because normalization is, 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 you know, is how you, you make everything legitimate and, 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 and simply irreversible. So that's what we have to be uh, careful about, that, uh, that there isn't a process in which Israel becomes much more stable and, 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 and thereby its whole occupation and its whole apartheid system also becomes more stable, you know, and, and, and less of an issue and the Palestinians disappear, and we normalize with the Arab world, and 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 through the UN, and so on, uh, and then it's over. So we have to really be on the on the watch. We have to be watchdogs in terms of this process of normalization. Um, you know, it's easy to fight apartheid and to fight occupation and to go fight. You know, it's not so easy when you have these processes like anti-normalization. <laughs> You know, it's it, it's not sexy. It's very abstract for people. You have to know a lot and so on. It's hard to mobilize the masses to deal with normalization issues. But this is exactly the quiet kinds of processes 
that go on in which a country like Israel wins. And so we have to really be sensitive to that. From your perspective, uh, looking at the November election, yeah, I mean, uh, Biden is, is, you know, there's not much he can do anymore. And we have seen other uh, US presidents at the end of their presidency trying to, you know, as a last ditch effort to, you know, contribute something to the to the peace process. From your perspective, who is worse as a potential next president, Trump or Harris? Well, in terms of Israel-Palestine or <laughs> in terms of everything. I, Israel, you know, specifically Israel-Palestine, yes. Well, with Israel-Palestine, it's hard to know. Um, I mean, from the point of the Palestinians, it's hard to know. I mean, Harris is, you know, again, this two-state thing. So she's really for apartheid. Trump, you don't know. I mean, Trump was the same thing. Trump is the one that told Israel, settle the West Bank. Trump is the one that brought the embassy to Tel Aviv, the American embassy. Trump's the one that legitimized, uh, you know, Israeli control over the Golan Heights. I mean, Trump is, has been more active than, than the Democrats in terms of uh, legitimizing Israeli uh, colonization. But Trump is so unpredictable. I mean, he could turn the other way tomorrow. He's, he doesn't like Netanyahu. He certainly doesn't want to get dragged into a war between Israel and Iran. He's America first. He doesn't want to get involved with foreign entanglements. And he could turn against Israel. So in, in, there is a scenario in which he could be worse for Israel. And by just by chance, better for the Palestinians. Not that he cares about Palestinians, but by being worse for Israel, He could he could uh, change the dynamics in a way in in favor of the Palestinians, especially if um, if if is you know he's very close to Saudi Arabia. Like you said, Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, you know, is still I think he made he's made two billion dollars out of Saudi Arabia since Trump was in office. So they they still have those ties. So you could see a situation in which there's normalization taking place between the United States, Saudi Arabia, the Arab world, without Israel, cutting Israel out of it, that Trump would do that Harris would never do. So there are scenarios in which Trump would be worse for Israel than the Democrats. Right now, you know, it, it appears that they're both equally bad because they're both equally, I mean, as of now and of as of Trump's track record, Uh, you know, they're both uh, uh, going to allow Israel to normalize its control over the occupied territory. Jeff, on that note, you were very generous with your time. But before we end this, is there any topic that we did not discuss that's close to your heart? Uh, I mean, not really. It's just that... Um, You know, I want to acknowledge, you know, the genocide in Gaza. I mean, I, it's always uncomfortable in a genocide or actually all these years when I've been working with Palestinians who are suffering daily all the time. Uh, when you go to a political level and you talk about, you know, you have analyses and scenarios and one state and two states, you know, and you tend, you know, you sort of lose that human element. And the suffering that 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 we're talking about here, uh, and so what I try to do in my talks is I try to say you know uh, there has to be a political resolution, and so we have to our hearts have to go out to the Palestinians, we have to acknowledge the genocide and the injustice and uh, and you know and 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 the suffering. But at this, you know, but at at some point we have to kind of disconnect as well, and move to a political analysis, a political program, that by nature is cold and calculating and so on. So I'm I'm always trying to find that balance. I don't want to be, because it's it's very. I mean, I've had people say to me, it's inappropriate to talk about a political process and a one state solution while genocide is going on. That should wait, but you it can't wait. We have to multitask because this normalization process I'm talking about is being pushed by Biden, even as we speak. I mean, it isn't like you know those things stop. So we can't 
have the luxury of saying, we're going to be single tasks. We're going to worry about this now, and then we'll worry about that. Later. We have to do it all together, even though genocide and uh, in Gaza and a, and a cold political analysis in which Israelis and Palestinians kind of live together in a democratic state don't seem to go together. But uh, but we have to do both. And I guess I want to emphasize the fact that by doing this political analysis, I'm not at all minimizing the suffering that the Palestinians are going through. Jeff, thank you very much for your time. As I said, I could go on and on. It's it's you're a very lively speaker. You know, you're very engaging. So I, I could listen to you. Astro, man. I could be five, six, seven hours with you. It's no problem. But we'll let it go at this stage. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a great evening right. in the UK. Thanks Give my regards to Chaim. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you for tuning into SaltCube Analytics. We hope today's episode gave you something to think about and challenged the way you see the world. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe or follow us and leave a review or a comment. Your feedback helps us keep questioning the status quo. For more insights and discussions, follow us on YouTube, Rumble, TikTok, Twitter, Spotify, Apple Podcasts or any of your other preferred podcast platforms. Until next time. Stay informed, stay curious and remember, always look beyond the headlines.